All right, welcome back to um, Genome Sciences. Today's lecture is about um, experimental genetics and how experimental genetics relates to genomics. Um, you could also consider this to be forward genetics. We're going to have another lecture about reverse genetics, and we'll talk about the distinction a little bit in the, in the beginning of this lecture. Um, but we're going to really focus on how experimental genetics uh, can relate to understanding gene function and, and sort of the nuts and bolts about how, how a f traditional forward genetic screen would work. I should say um, this, um, this image here in the beginning, uh, courtesy of the Jackson Labs, is, um, is a graphical map of the, of the mouse from, I think, the 1950s, where each chromosome is laid out on the wall there, and they have mice with phenotypes that have been linked to each chromosome in the appropriate places there. So it's sort of a genetic map, but, but on the wall there with live mice, sort of a cool um, historical um, image. Right, so you're going to learn a lot about in this course about all these different genome scale methods to look at, for example, whether genes are co-expressed, whether they interact with each other in protein-protein interactions, whether they, say, have shared patterns of conservation over evolution, maybe whether there's a binding site of particular transcription factors in the genome. And the key point to take home from this lecture is all of this is meaningless if you don't know the loss of function phenotype of your gene. As much as, that, as these other pieces of information link your gene to a particular process, until you can show how losing the, the activity of that gene impacts that process, you don't really know anything about what that gene is really doing. Right, so, <clears throat> so this is sort of the key point, that a gene's function what it's important for in the cell will, will manifest itself in the loss of function phenotype and that, that um, or gain of function phenotype in some cases. So when that gene is, is altered, the phenotypes that you see will result from the processes that are defective in, the, in those mutants, right? So this is just some images of some um, of my favorite organism, worms, and this is a, what a wild-type worm looks like. And we have some worms, for example, this worm here is rolling around. Um, on its axis, a roller worm, um, so it maybe has some defect in, in, in its nervous system or in, in its skin. It turns out mostly these are skin defects in the case of the worm. Um, this is a, um, a dumpy worm, it's called, which is um, sort of a short, fat worm. Again, it has to do with the fact that the skin hasn't allow, um, properly um, formed to allow it to make its normal, long um, worm shape. This is an uncoordinated worm, so it's just sort of lying there, um, not moving very much. And that, suggests that the gene that's mutated is somehow important for, um, for muscle activity or the nervous system activity, again, it's a proper motility. And so, um, so <clears throat> if you have a process that you're interested in, then really the, the tr classical way to identify genes that are important for that process is to do a, a genetic screen, identify mutants where that process is altered in some way, and then to do additional experiments to figure out what those genes are and how they are, how they are important for that process. Right, so it's important to choose the right system when you do this. Right, so you don't want um, to you spend all of your money. For example, if you're going to do a screen about um, the very basics of how the secretory path pathway works. That was all worked out you know, several decades ago now in yeast by Randy Sheckman and others using genetic screens in, in that organism where there's extremely powerful genetics. You can generate really large collections, saturated mutagenesis. You can really identify all the genes that, are, that have loss of function phenotypes or gain of function phenotypes that are associated with that process. However, you can't use yeast, for example, to study, study clotting because yeast, one, they don't clot because they don't have blood, they don't have vasculature. And so if you're going to study clotting, you can't do it, and you can't even do it in worm because worms, it turns out, don't have vasculature either. So you have to do that in, in some um, vertebrate system where you have the, the clotting, um, clotting system that, that's similar to ours. Right, so here's sort of a wide range listed on the slide of sort of commonly used genetic systems, and they really span the whole range of, of evolution from mouse, which is you know, a mammalian model system very similar to humans and has certain advantages we'll talk about, you know, all the way down to yeast, where you know, if you're looking at common conserved eukaryotic cell biological functions, then yeast is often really the place where you get the most bang for your buck. You, know, you can grow you know, 
10 to the ninth yeast for a couple, a couple of dollars worth of media, whereas, you know, mouse, you're going to pay, you know, huge thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars in cage costs for, you know, a, a smaller experiment where you deal with, um, you know, just really a handful of mice. All right, so to do a, a um, phenotype-based mutagenesis, a genetic screen, you need one to have a way to induce mutations into the genomes so that you can then have a have a population of animals to, or individuals that you can select for some or, or um, identify that have a particular phenotype and then we'll talk a little bit about the breeding schemes that are used in in animal systems in particular for for identifying um, mutants from screens All right so the simplest way to induce mutations is by um, just letting them happen on their own. You know, so remember, mutations are fairly common. So there's the, the per base mutation. It's about ten to the minus eighth per base, right? So that, um, you know, in in practice means that there's going to be some kind of a loss of function um, mutation, but well, one in any given gene, but one in ten to the seventh, right? So about ten of those mutations are likely to give you strong loss of function. Maybe that's a slight underestimate. Right. And this, you know, so mutations, of course, you know, occur, you know, just spontaneously due to, for example, due to, to damage, like base loss or cytosine damination, but also through errors in DNA replication. And um, <clears throat> if you have a genetic system, for example, um, in flies, this was sort of the identification of the white-eyed flies by, um, um, by, by Morgan over 100 years ago. Um, though that was a, a spontaneous um, um, mutation that he identified in his stocks, right? So um, in yeast, since you can grow 10 to the ninth yeast, even though the mutation rate is 10 to the minus 8, in your population 10 to the ninth yeast, you've got all the mutations in there. So you can, you can just plate those out, and if you have some selection, for example, you're looking for yeast that grow on a particular drug, you'll get, you'll get colonies that, associate, that correspond to your mutations without having to do any mutagenesis whatsoever. Right. On the other hand, if you're doing with a, a genetic screen in mouse, and you can maybe handle at most, say, a few hundred individuals out of your, out of your screen, then you're not going to be able to deal with spontaneous mutation. You need to go in actively and add some mutagen. And so sort of the, the classical ways of doing this are through radiation, chemical mutagenesis, and insertional mutagenesis. And so, uh, you know, with the radiation, the idea would be that you have, um, you know, an X-ray machine, um, not, not this, um, this wouldn't be the actual machine you'd use. You put your mouse there. Um, you would typically do this with a male mouse, so you can get mutations in in the sperm um, precursors. And then the idea is that each sperm will have you have a different mutation in it, and um, and let them go. Now, X-rays have certain or um, radiation-based based mutagenesis. Gamma rays, X-rays have the advantage that they tend to make sort of fairly large mutation, um, strong effect alleles by making double-stranded breaks, and then you get the repair of those, causing, so say, big deletions. So you can actually delete several genes in a row, which can be really useful if you're dealing with a process where you have a lot of duplicated genes. It turns out um, number, in most species, there's actually uh, enrichment for, for genes that have similar um, <coughs> or homology to each other being located adjacent, adjacent in the genome. And so this, this method gives you some chance of making deletions that take out both copies of a gene if you have two. Um, most mutagenesis these days is actually done through, in, in most model organisms, is done by, by chemical mutagenesis with chemicals like EMS, um, it's an ethyl methane sulfonate or ethyl nitrose urea, which um, these are alkylating agents that, that basically the idea is that these will, will, will add some kind of um, methyl or other alkyl group to your DNA bases, and then that will somehow cause, cause um, a defect, either misrecognition of the base or, or some kind of defect associated with the repair of those bases. And those... Um, those um, have different biases and different advantages. It turns out that, that for example, EMS was really commonly used in, in most genetic screens in worm and fly, and it um, will give you, you know, something like one in 2,000 um, <clears throat> um, individuals will have uh, a mutation in any given gene, a, strong, a reasonably strong mutation in any given gene. In mouse, uh, 
EMS doesn't work that well, probably because it's probably metabolized in a way that allows it not to be as effective, and so ENU is the mutagenesis of choice. But that's really sort of worked out empirically for each, um, each organism. Um, and then so the last way is insertional or transposon mutagenesis, and so it's most famous in fly where they have the, this phenomenal tool, the p-element tool, where you can go and you can have these p-elements, uh, basically transposons, jump into the genome, and when it's, if it disrupts a gene, you have a mutation in that gene. And that has the, the huge advantage that now you actually have a little molecular marker there that can use to identify exactly what the gene is. If you have a phenotype, you can just do some kind of inverse PCR, figure out what the insertion site of your transposon in, there you have your gene. So it's easy, right? Okay, so just to, to emphasize the advantage of these uh, mutagenesis methods is the much higher rate, right? So you, you can have... And now it's actually astonishing. You can get this one in 700, basically, mutation rate per, per gamete, per locus, which is amazing. That can even be tolerated. Right. And it's important, I think, I mentioned that this has to be worked out empirically. Sort of a key feature is what the actual dose is that you use. So you don't want to use too low of a dose because then you won't get enough mutants. And if you don't, you, want, you don't want to use too much dose because then these, these chemicals are toxic. You just think either both from... from from other mechanisms and from the, the just you know toxicity of having too many mutations in there, so um, if you have too much dose, you're going to have also not enough mutants because you're not going to get any animals out of it. And so really, for each each system, there's been a the, for um, sort of the well studied systems, there's been work to figure out what the optimal dose is. And this, um, if you're d developing a new model system, of course, you have to work this out um, empirically each time. Okay, so, so here's sort of the, the, the pros and cons of doing traditional forward genetics, right? So <clears throat> the advantages, you can get lots of different mutations. You do a screen, especially in an organism where you can get a lot of individuals, you, know, you can easily get a huge number of, of mutations. One of my neighbors in our genetics department here just recently did, did a screen where they spent, uh, I think, a couple months over the summer, and they got hundreds of individual mutations that affect the process they're interested in, and in, this is in worm. Um, in addition, you get a rich variety of alleles. So we'll talk about reverse genetics, where in reverse genetics is when you, um, you have a gene you're interested in, you, you just um, specifically knock out that gene either by RNAi or by targeted deletion of various kinds. And you really, you're, you're going specifically trying, trying to get either a, a strong loss of function or a null allele for those genes. Whereas with, with a forward genetic screen, you can get a really wide variety of partial loss of function and sort of regional and specific loss of function, regulatory element mutations. Um, you can get gain of function mutations as well. <clears throat> and um, everything is, is tied to the phenotype that you screen for. And, and this I can't emphasize enough that if you ask a question with genetics, you'll get an answer. You don't, it doesn't, it's not guaranteed you'll get the answer that you want because you, you may not have been asking the question that you thought you were asking. So if you, ask, if you screen for a particular phenotype, you'll find out how you can get that phenotype, but not necessarily um, what the process is that you thought was going to give rise to that phenotype. So it's important to be really sure that your phenotype is specific to, to the process you're interested in. Now, the disadvantages, one, it's a lot of work to perform a screen. I, I mentioned the screen that my, my colleague performed that did take, you know, basically the lab spent a couple of months doing the screen. Um, and the other is that you identify all these mutants that have, have um, phenotypes related to the process you're interested in, but there's a fair amount of effort involved once you have the mutant to figure out actually what's wrong with it. Um, if I mentioned that, for example, in mouse, in the ENU mutagenesis, you have one out of 700 genes is, is affected, you know, there's going to be you know, really thousands of, of actual um, sequence changes caused by that mutagenesis in any given mutant. And so you have to be able to have some way of sorting through and figuring out which are the causal ones. And traditionally, that would be done by a, first a linkage study to figure out where in the, in the genome it is. And then you know, some kind of fine mapping approach, you know, where you would try to maybe identify mutations in the genes in the region that you would map your, your phenotype to. Now, this is changing a lot. The next-gen sequencing approaches have, have provided new ways to identify your mutants, and we'll talk about that towards the end. Okay, so a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to be a mouse, and I just want to put out the plug for why mouse is a, is a system that's perhaps underutilized for forward genetics. Um, it is expensive. However, um, it has um, a lot of big advantages. One, 
there's inbreeding, and inbreeding is really important. It means that both copies of the genome are essentially the same in an inbred mouse strain, so you don't have the allelic um, diversity between two alleles in the strain getting in the way. Um, the genetics are pretty powerful. I mentioned the, the mutagenesis, for example, and there's a lot of, um, of really useful tools. We'll talk about balancer chromosomes, visible markers that you can use for mapping. Um, there's really useful ways to manipulate the genome. So, for example, you can go into ES cells and create targeted insertions, deletions in different parts of the genome. And it's, it's because it's such a well-studied organism and it has a lot of parallels, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a mammal, and so it has a lot of parallels with our development. So there's been a, a lot of um, a, a really detailed phenotyping. So you, we know a lot about the way normals are supposed to look. All right, so this has been really, you know, <clears throat> This is um, a quote that came out with the publication of the mouse genome in, um, I think it was 2001 or 2002. And um, you know, the argument was that now with, with the mouse genome, we can really take some of the variants that we identify as associated with human disease, and we can directly correlate those with what's going on in the mouse, and that, that mouse models are going to be the, um, the most um, powerful way to interpret um, human disease alleles. Now, whether that's true or not, I mean, I think that in many cases you can, you can go to an even simpler system, worms or flies, for example, and, and you should if, you, if that's the appropriate system to do your modeling in. But ma mouse has the advantage of having, you know, really um, uh, in many ways similar physiology, although definitely not identical to humans. Um, and just to, to other, also emphasize that some of the, the phenotypes, not just say, you know, we think about in human genetics, things like heart attack as a, as a phenotype. But then there's the endophenotypes, you know, like the LDL levels and the triglycerides and so forth and so on. And so a mouse is, a, is often a good system to look at those phenotypes as well and sort of the quantitative traits. All right. <clears throat> so if you're going to do the screen in the mouse, and this is different, you know, in worms, if you're doing a phenotypic screen, typically you try to find the most specific um, phenotype is you, that you can for the process you're interested in. Maybe you have a fluorescent marker for a cell that you're interested in, and then you screen and you look for, for worms that have defects in some kind of morphological defect or presence absence defects of that cell that you're interested in. Now in mouse, you want to have as rich a screen as possible because you're going to deal with the issue of cost here. And so if you're going to go th through the cost of doing a screen, you want to get as broad a set of, of, of mutants as possible. And so this is where this nested phenotypic analysis comes in. The idea is that you should start with a fairly um, general phenotype, and we'll talk about um, about um, wheel running as one of those. And then when you, when you identify mutants that have some some defects in these in these very high level phenotypes that are very um, cost effective, and you can apply to your whole population, then you go and do more detailed phenotype, and maybe uh, on on subsets of the population. All right. So here's an example of wheel running. Right, so wheel running is a great uh, experiment because all the mice in your screen, you know, as long as they're they're up and on their feet, will run on the wheel. So you can put the mouse on the wheel and see what um, see what they do. And this is um, sort of a plot of what um, um, that looks like. So this is just um, a number of different um, uh, different days. I think you put the mouse on the wheel for five, six days here. Um, there's a six different m mice rather for two days. You can see that when there's a little black bar, that means that the wheel was moving, and when there's not, that means the mouse basically wasn't moving. So you can see the activity sort of corresponds. Mice are nocturnal, and so when it's dark, you know, which is this period here, there's a lot of activity, and when it's light, there's not a lot of activity. And so this, for example, Maya Buchan in our department did a, a large screen to identify um, um, using wheel running as the main phenotype. And others have used this as well. This is this is what happens. Uh, just for example, you can get not in only defects or, or phenotypes associated with motility and sort of sort of the wheel running itself, but you can turn off the lights and see what happens um, to the circadian pattern. So so normally um, the mice will continue running, you know, at roughly 24-hour period. It turns out it's slightly less than 24 hours. And if you have a circadian mutant, you'll see defects in this process. So this is a really um, fairly broad, um, broadly useful phenotype. Right, so you can get mutants not just in, in, for example, visual mutants where they don't know if it's light or dark, circadian rhythm mutants where maybe they, they lose their, their period and their connection to the rotating earth. Um, neuromuscular mutants where you actually have um, um, mice that are having a hard time running. 
um, sleep mutants, where maybe they are waking up when they should be sleeping and running in the middle of the, the daytime, um, and so forth and so on. Right, and then maybe you go on to some more some expensive, you have some Canada sleep mutants, you go and actually put an EEG on those mice and see, well, are these actually having sleep defects that we can identify with this more expensive, expensive test. All right, so let's talk briefly about the actual schemes that are used to generate mutants in a forward mutagenesis screen. So um, we'll talk first about dominant screens and then recessive screens. Dominant are easier than recessive screens. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how you identify the gene or that, that's responsible for your phenotype. And then at the end, we'll, actually, we'll talk about, about some alternative mutagenesis screens where you're actually sort of trying in a phenotype neutral way to identify mutations across the genome. All right, so the simplest screen would be a dominant screen, and this is an example from, from mouse. Now you remember mouse, the most common mutagenesis is ENU, so you feed, you, you give the, the usually a male mouse, the ENU, in their food, and that goes in, and it will um, wreak havoc, havoc in their germline, and usually you'll get a period where they're sterile because the, the um, sperm stem cells have died back, and eventually they'll repopulate and they'll have mutations in them. And so, this is useful to do in a male because now you can mate that male and every progeny in theory will have, and this is important, a different mutation, right? So the idea is that you, you're, you're aiming not to get um, um, different, um, the same mutation a bunch of times, but you want to get different mutations in each individual. And when you mate this male mouse to a, to a unmutagenized female, then you're, in your first generation you'll have one normal copy of, the, of each chromosome and one mutagenized copy of each chromosome. And if you're doing a, a screen for dominant mutants, you can just take those first generation mice and do a phenotypic analysis. Look, do they um, have trouble running on the wheel? Do they have, if you're doing this in flies, what color are their eyes? So, you know, whatever your screen is, you can screen in that first generation. And, and then, you know, if you have something, then you can start, you know, doing other crosses to maintain those, those, those mice. A recessive mutation screen is much more tricky, and I'm going to go through the simpler version, which is how we would do it in worm. Um, worms have the advantage of being a self-fertilizing hermaphrodite, and so you don't actually have to cross males and females, and that has um, huge advantages in a recessive screen. And then we'll go through a slightly more complicated example of how you would do this in mouse. Right, so, so in the case of worms, you would use EMS instead of ENU as the mutagen, and you would add that. In general, you would um, soak worms at a particular stage. Again, you're actually, the strategy is pretty similar. You're trying to get mutations into the sperm um, primarily, um, although you get into the oocytes as well in the case of worms. And, um, and you grow those on a plate, and you have one big plate with lots of mutagenized worm. So, um, and those will have um, their F1 progeny. Right? And so here's... Um, if you're looking for a viable mutation, you can just leave those, again, all on, on one or a small number of plates. But if you're dealing with mutations that are going to be um, homozygous lethal, which is a pretty common kind of screen to want to do, um, maybe you're looking for, for defects in, in skin development where the, where the embryos blow up at the point when they try to, to, to elongate their skin. And so those would be lethal. Um, and a recessive lethal in the first generation, you're gonna, maybe perhaps you have one plate that has... Um, a heterozygote for that um, mutation on it. So it's got one normal copy and one mutant copy. Right? And so if you have basically what you've singled, you've singled these F1 worms, one worm onto each plate. And in the second generation then, now each one of these, these worms will go on to give a population of its own progeny. Remember, they self with each other, and so they're taking their own sperm and their own eggs and mixing them together. And it's basically the same as an intercross. So if we look in the second generation, these um, plates where there isn't any um, um, mutation won't give us our phenotype. But on this plate where we had the heterozygote um, to begin with, now 25% of its progeny are, um, um, oops, these are switched. 25% um, of its progeny are going to be homozygous wild type. Half the progeny are going to be heterozygotes and a quarter of them will be homozygous now if you're mutation, so that, that's sort of denoted here with this little sepia color on the worms, and so you have mutant worms on the plate, and you can recover the heterozygotes if it's a lethal by picking up um, their siblings from the same plate. 
Now, in a uh, gonochoristic or organism, uh, somebody where you, uh, organism where you have males and females, and you have to actually mate them together, it gets a little bit more complicated again. So, <clears throat> the beginning is basically the same. So, this is true in mouse, this is fly, fish. You would have to do a similar kind of breeding scheme. So, you have your your ENU treated male here. Now, again, each sperm is going to have a different mutation in that male, and you cross that with a wild type female and you get this um, heterozygous mutant, um, F1. Now, <clears throat> here's the important um, thing. That is the only animal that has the, the particular mutations. So there, are, there aren't other animals that have the same mutations, and so you have to find a way to get that mutation homozygous. And so one way you might be able to do this would be to then cross that um, that um, heterozygous mutant to a wild type worm. And then <clears throat> if you do that, half the progeny will be wild type, and half the progeny will be heterozygous again. And if you get males and females in this next generation, it's important obviously that you have males and females, then you can cross those together with each other. And if you do that one quarter of the time, you'll cross two heterozygous mutants together and a quarter of their progeny will be homozygous mutants, and you'll be able to see your phenotype. Okay, so that's um, definitely possible, and if you have large brood size, not maybe, maybe even reasonably um, efficient, but you can, there's actually a trick you can do to make this even more efficient, that's to back cross to the father. So <clears throat> we, have, we start the same way here, but instead of taking... Um, Right, so this, so this is a male here, right? So you take a male from your first generation. Now, you know that that has, is a heterozygous for your mutant chromosomes. And so if you make now the cross between the, the second generation progeny, remember half of those are going to be heterozygous and half of them are gonna be wild type homozygotes. You cross those back to their father, now half of those are going to be useful matings where you're crossing, because it's only, it only depends on this one, um, this one generation's um, genotypes. And so now half matings are going to give you um, useful distributions of progeny and the chance to see your homozy homozygous phenotype. And again, once, once you identify homozygous mutants there, then you can pick the, the wild type litter mates and, and hopefully some of those will be the heterozygotes and you can propagate your mutation. Okay, one sort of additional wrinkle that can be used, um, and this um, is especially useful if you have a case where a process where you know there's a particular gene or collection of genes that are likely to be interesting, they're in a particular part of the genome, but um, you want to have more alleles of those genes, is you can do a region-specific gene where you have um, something called a balancer chromosome. Let's see if this will, um, okay, come up. There you go. So, so a balancer and this is most, um, most powerful um, and has the longest history in flies where they have good balancers for all the chromosomes. And what a balancer chromosome is basically a, ideally a multiply deleted or inverted um, um, chromosome. So that chromosome has two features. One, it'll be homozygous lethal. And two, it won't recombine with the normal copy of the chromosome. Or if it does recombine, the recombination products will be lethal. And so... Um, and, if that, and that'll occur if you have these, these you know, even in case one, one inversion or multiple inversions will make it even more powerful. All right, so, so again, you want suppression of recombination, embryonic lethality, and it's even more, it helps a lot if you also have a dominant visible marker. So in the case of this rump white chromosome that we'll use as an example, it gives you this, this white patch on, on, on the animal. All right, but then, and then they're also going to be um, dead if, as homozygotes, and so you can use those to identify mutants that are specifically in Basically, all you can get all of the mutant, mutagenized chromosomes from your particular um, um, balanced region of the genome. Right, so the way this works, you mutagenize your 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 parent, and you cross it to the heterozygote for the balancer. When you do that, you're going to get two types of progeny out. You'll get a mutant chromosome over the balancer, and you'll get a mutant chromosome without the balancer. And, the, and you can use the dominant phenotype to identify which one is which, and so you can just keep these ones, which have the mutant over the balancer. <coughs> okay. 
And um, if you want to identify the homozygotes for that, you can do it. Um, this is sort of a slightly more complex screen where you where you where you then can say cross that that um, mutant to another um, balanced mutation. In this case, you have the same balancer, this rump white balancer, with uh, another dominant marker called hammer toe over it, over it. And you can get because remember the same as in the first as in the earlier examples. This is the first this first um, heterozygous mutant you have is the only mutant of that type you have, so you need to have somebody to cross it to. So if you do this cross to this um, hammer toe heterozygote, now you're going to get the balancer um, homozygotes, and those are going to be lethal. That's this one here. Um, and then you can also get hammer toe over wild type. Um, sorry, hammer toe over the mutant, which will look like hammer toe. You'll get hammer toe over the balancer, and you'll get more of your balanced mutant. So you can. this is a way you can get the balanced mutant out as, in a way you can recognize it easily. And you can now get many individuals that have this, this balanced mut, uh, mutant chromosome that you can then um, um, intercross with each other to maintain that mutation. Right. So then you look, <coughs> once you intercross these, these homozygote, this balancer mutant heterozygotes, you can intercross those and you'll pull out individuals that either have the dominant marker, so these are your rump white individuals, they're heterozygotes for your mutant region, and you'll get the non-rump white individuals, and those are homozygotes for your rump white individuals. You know for this particular region they're, they're homozygous for whatever mutations were present in, um, the, you know, came out of your mutagenesis, and you can screen you know, in detail for, for phenotypes in those animals. Okay, so once you have your, your mutants breeding true, how do you find what gene is actually involved? And so the old way you would do this would be sort of traditional genetic mapping. You would, um, you would cross your mutant to a number of different, say, visible markers. You would look at how frequently there were recombinations between your gene and the different visible markers. Maybe instead of visible markers, you might you know, more recently use SNPs or some other kind of molecular marker. You compare those. Um, to the genetic map, and you can place your gene under chromosomes. Maybe you use the three-factor cross to do fine mapping. This is all a lot of work, right? And then once you've done you know, all the mapping you can do, you probably narrowed your gene down to you know, maybe five genes, 10 genes, 20 genes. And you have to look through all those genes to see which one actually has the muta mutation that you can, um, that you can link to your, your um, phenotype. Okay, so so more popular um, recent, addition, recent method is, is SNP mapping. So now instead of crossing to a different visible marker for each strain, you can, t you can do um, take advantage of natural polymorphism. So you remember humans, we have about one nucleotide difference every thousand base pairs or so. And it turns out you know, in these model organism species, there are similar cases. So in worms, there's a Hawaiian strain, which is, also has about one um, single nucleotide polymorphism for every thousand bases or so. There are similar strains for fly, for mouse, and so on. Right, so you cross your mutant strain. Perhaps in the simplest case, you have a, a viable homozygous mutant here. This is your strain A. Right, and you, um, you cross that to strain B. And strain B is, is from a different um, natural isolate that has a bunch of single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so in the F1 generation, the result of that is you're going to have heterozygotes. So you're going to be heterozygous for your mutant, and each one of these um, um, little lines on here represents a SNP. That's the location where strain A and strain B are different. And if you intercross these F1s together and pull out just the mutants in the next generation, you'll find that it's random whether they get, you know, sometimes they'll get all strain B, sometimes you'll get heterozygotes for strain A and strain B, sometimes you'll just get strain A SNPs, but in the region directly around your mutation, you're only going to be homozygous for strain A. Right, so this is SNP mapping, and this has been, been used um, you know, for, for a long time now, but this has been scaled up in a form that's known as bulk segregant analysis, it's been combined with whole genome sequencing to allow sort of rapid um, identification of the disease mutation. Okay, so the way this works now, 
is the same strategy now. This is an example from worms, but this has also been done in, in mouse. Um, again, you have um, your, um, this is just an example where you have um, two chromosomes. Here, here, say chromosome one, chromosome two, and chromosome two is the, is the chromosome where your mutation is, right? So you cross your homozygous mutant with a mapping strain, in this case this, this Hawaiian strain that has one SNP every 1,000 bases or so. You get your heterozygous F1s, you um, intercross yourself in the case of worms, those F1s, and you pull out the mutants, right? And so if you look in your pool of mutants, you pick a bunch of F2s. The mutant F2s, remember they're all going to be homozygous for the SNPs in this region right around your mutation. Whereas all the other places in the genome are going to have about half of the Hawaiian SNP and half of the Bristol SNP. And then you take that whole population and you just sequence it. And you ask, how often do we see the Hawaiian SNP? How often do we see the, the Bristol SNP? And if you look at most chromosomes, you'll see, you know, roughly even amounts. There might be some, some sort of technical bias, but basically re even, even amounts of the two, um, the two um, genotypes. But if you look at the chromosome where your mutation is, you see a pattern like this, right? So um, this red um, hatch line is the actual um, causative mutation, and basically the area around that hatch line has essentially no Hawaiian um, SNPs, it's only the Bristol alleles. And you can see sort of a classic linkage peak where it, it sort of the amount of Hawaiian SNPs goes up as you get further and further away from your causative site. And since you're doing whole genome sequencing here, you can actually go and look now in this region where you've mapped it, what are the actual mutations there? And if you, in, ideally you have multiple alleles and you can identify, say, multiple different um, mutant strains that have mutations that cause the same phenotype in the same gene, and that will give you sort of the smoking gun. Right, so that's an important point. Just because you map your mutation to a particular region, you map your phenotype to a particular region in the genome, and you find a mutation in the gene, that doesn't provide conclusive evidence that that gene is the gene that's responsible for your phenotype. This has happened many, many times that it's turned out that it's actually a gene next door that, ha that, is, the, that is the causative gene, and it happens to be there's also a mutation that's not causative in, in, the, in, in the neighboring gene. Right? So other evidence that you can use, really the key, the key point is that you've got to have multiple lines of evidence to really um, show that your, this particular gene is important. And so um, one way to do that is to have multiple alleles, right? So if you do your, whoops, you do your screen and you find four different mutants that are all mapping to that same region and all have mutations in the same, same gene, that's great. You can go in and you can, if it's an a, a experimental system where this is fairly straightforward, you can put the wild type copy of the gene back into your mutant and see if that rescues the phenotype. You can see if you can knock out that gene directly, for example, by RNAi or by directed um, um, knockout, and see if that causes the same phenotype as, as, as you've mapped to that region. You know, or you can actually take, um, um, and then this is all supplementing the fact that you've already linked either by linkage mapping, SNP mapping with um, bulk segregant analysis, or perhaps deficiency mapping, which is where you cross your mutant to a, to a known deletion to see if, if you get a, a synthetic phenotype in the F1s as a result of that. Right, so if you have multiple lines of evidence here, that's pr pretty good evidence then that you have the right gene. Right, so the last thing um, I'd like to talk about today is, is sort of uh, reverse genetic application of sort of traditional forward genetics tools. And so reverse genetics is when you have a gene that you're interested in, you, find, you make a mutation in that gene, then you look at what the phenotype is. Right. And so tilling is an approach where you actually <clears throat> take a library, and this was first done with, with plants, but it's also done with mouse embryonic stem cells. So the idea is, for example, in mouse, you grow up a big population of embryonic stem cells that you mutagenize the stem cells and you take different pools of those stem cells and then you use a molecular screening technique. Um, <clears throat> you can think of this as, you know, I mean, in a perfect world you could actually sequence and this is actually sort of the way going forward this is going to be done. Each of those, each of those client clones identify clones that have mutations in a gene that you're interested in and then inject those into, into mouse embryos and make, make, um, make mice out of them. Right. And a similar kind of project has been done in Cialga, and it's actually using direct, um, direct um, 
mutagenesis of worms. So you can, so this is the Million Mutants Project, which is um, um, being led by Bob Waterston and Don Mormon um, primarily, where they've sequenced now almost 2,000 strains, and they've um, <clears throat> they've taken each of these strains as, as a result of EMS mutagenesis, and it's been back or intercrossed so that it's you know as as close as possible to being homozygous for a collection of mutations. And by, by se sequencing these 2,000 strains, they've identified 800,000 mutations. Right, so that's that's something. What is that 400 mutations per strain? Now, um, <clears throat> many of these are putative, putative null mutations. You can see the number of genes they've identified. Null, so null mutation would be either a, a strong splice site mutation early in the gene, early stop code on, things like that. So only about a third, a third of the genes have those strong null mutations. You can imagine there's a strong selection against those in genes that are lethal. You're just not going to pull those out of your screen. But they have, you know, on, on, on average, nine other um, alleles per gene, so even in genes where maybe the, the deletion allele would be lethal, you actually can go and find partial loss of function alleles from this set is the idea, and go and characterize them for your, for your phenotype. Right. So there's um, lots of tools. Um, we talked a little bit about mouse genetics, and this, um, this um, web page um, at the Jackson Lab is really useful for learning about, about what tools exist for mouse genetics, and there's similar databases for other organisms, worm-based for worm, fly-based for Drosophila, um, there's SGD for yeast, etc. Thanks.